Well, welcome to School of Ministry Week 3. It's, um, it's a privilege to come and, and it's a fearful thing to come and stand as one sent of the Lord. It's a fearful thing to, to speak the Word of God. And the more I do it, the more I come here trembling, going, what am I doing here? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Um, help Jesus. So we're going to begin in prayer. I know we've already prayed, but we're going to pray again and ask for the Lord's help in this message tonight. So this is coming on, we're up to week three now. I spoke two weeks ago um, on the Apostolic Foundations and it was based on Acts chapter 13. And one of the questions I had in there was there were those at the church in Antioch, or those in the, sorry, those in the church at Antioch, and the great question is, are we in church or are we at church? That will change everything. That will bring meaning to eternal reality, which is truth. In fact, eternity is reality. Time is passing. Time is temporal. It's not that time is not a reality, but there is a greater reality, which is Christ. There's a greater reality, which is the eternal intentions and thoughts of God. And until we start hearing messages that are sent and are based on God's eternal purpose, God's eternal destiny, then we're just playing fluffy games at church, listening to TED Talks and encouraging messages that mostly aren't sent, that are keeping us in bondage, keeping us... at in this baby Christianity, which is the most base level, and it's keeping us from the person of Christ. So it's dangerous. It's dangerous keeping people at low levels. It's, it's going to be a fearful thing. And it is a fearful thing, those who teach, isn't it? Didn't Paul say that? Okay, so we're going to pray, and then I'm going to get us to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Lord, I thank you for tonight. Lord, I come here not even really understanding uh, all that you have. But Lord, I pray that you would take possession of this vessel, that whatever you want communicated out of this chapter tonight and any readings or any text tonight, Lord, that you would take control that your voice would be heard and not this Kiwi Australian accent, this piece of dust from New Zealand, but something of, of Christ would be seen and heard tonight. I pray that the Eternals would be made alive in our hearts that true sending would be made alive, that the true apostolic would be made plain to us. Lord, I pray for a discerning heart, Lord, for everyone listening. Lord, I pray for an impartation from your spirit tonight into the mysteries of what is apostolic, what is prophetic. Lord, forgive us for casual reading. Forgive us for casual Christianity. Forgive us for treating lightly the things of the kingdom of God. Will we come to you, Lord, afresh tonight, asking that we would have ears to hear, eyes to see, 
open our spiritual eyes, Lord, to see the Lord high and lifted up. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6. And has anybody here not read Isaiah chapter 6 ever? You've never read it. So everybody here in this room has read Isaiah 6? Yeah. Um, I too have read it. I've listened to it and I've read it and I've reread it and I've read commentaries on it and and I still read it and I'm still amazed at it. I I've read it so many times and at one stage I thought I had a good understanding on it and then I read it again last night, today, multiple times. And as I keep reading it, the Lord keeps opening things up to me. And we're just going to read the first few verses. So this is about the calling of Isaiah. Chapter 6 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings and two he covered with his face, two he covered with his feet or covered his feet, and two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me. Can you feel and hear the weight on that woe? Man, I can, I can feel it. <clears throat> woe is me, I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having on his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. We'll stop there. Isn't it funny that we have a small amount of text yet describing the beginning of Isaiah's ministry, Isaiah's calling, Isaiah's sending. It's not unlike the Lord to, to say a whole lot without saying very much. And there's something waiting and something wanting upon us to go and search it out. It's like, and they crucified him. <laughs> and how much is in those words, and they crucified him? So we look at these verses and I believe it's It's incumbent upon us as believers to spend time in this and slow our reading down. We need to read. There's reading and then there's reading the Word of God. So our homework reading is Isaiah 6, the whole chapter. It won't hurt you. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> It'll be good. Amen the more we get it in, um, the better. So, on the top of the notes, we've got the scripture there. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Whom shall I send? Even that says a lot. 
In other words, not many. Whom? It's a question mark. Who shall I send? It's not the masses. This is where our charismatic Christianity, our Pentecostalism, our churchianity has gone mad thinking it's, it's everybody. Everybody gets a crack. Everybody has a turn. This is a democracy, don't you know? Isn't it meant to be everybody is allowed a turn? But so few, I believe. Many are called but few are chosen. Who will actually come to this place? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? So one of the mysteries of God, and there's many, is that his preferred method to communicate to mankind is through man. His blessings and his judgment. And the mystery of that is, is that he chooses fallen man to do it. You and I. A chosen vessel. But it's a vessel that's been prepared. It's not just any vessel. It's not someone who just names the name of the Lord. This is somebody who has come to a statement that we're going to read shortly. Woe is me. So in all sending, so we're talking about the apostolic. I want to focus on Isaiah's sending. This is apostolic. We learnt in the first week that Apostolic comes from the Greek word apostolos, which means sent one or send or messenger. This is sending. And we can talk about Moses' sending. We can talk about Jeremiah's sending. Um, we can talk about many people's sending. But I want to focus on Isaiah's. There's a sequence of events here that are important for us. And in all of God's sending, there's a revealing of the Lord. So there's going to be many ministries that you'll come across in your time here on earth that call themselves apostolic. But how much of their ministry is revealing the Lord? It's not enough to say you need to seek God. You need to reveal Christ by life and by death. The man of God, the woman of God, should always be pointing to another. This is like the Godhead, isn't it? Doesn't the Godhead always point to itself? God is always pointing to God. The Holy Spirit is always making known the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is always glorifying the Father. So everything that is apostolic has to be glorifying the Lord, has to be exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. Another way you can say it, I think I wrote it in the notes here, no matter which way you slice the salami, it's still salami, right? You can dice it, you can slice it thin, you can slice it with big chunks. You can slice it on an angle. It's the same with the apostolic. Whichever way you slice it, it's still going to be sent. It's still issuing forth from God, glorifying God. And so when we come across apostolic ministries, no matter what angle you look at it, it needs to be pointing to Christ. If there's one angle that doesn't point to Christ in it, it's not apostolic. It has now been found null and void. I'm talking one angle. If one angle is off, you've the, the leaven has leavened the whole lump. It's not that that can't be redeemed, 
but we need to be real about things. We need to be, we can't permit something that is false in ministry. My goodness, it's supposed to be revealing Christ. All facets of, of ministry is unto a person. It's glorifying the Lord or it's not. It's either lifting up the Lord Jesus or it's glorifying man. It's drawing to itself. So any way you slice the apostolic, it's always going to be pointing to Christ. It's always pointing to a person. It's always pointing to another. Amen. So I've got a couple of scriptures here about the apostolic. It's always giving off. So Ephesians 4.11, so Christ gave the apostles. Again, it's issued forth from a person, not from a nice idea or a, or a need <laughs> or a want or a nice thing or a concept. It came forth from the Lord Jesus himself. It was given of the Lord Jesus. It came from him. So if it's truly apostolic, it's going to issue forth from him. It backs it up in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles. We're talking about the apostolic. This is the foundation of the church. If the foundation is wanting... If the foundation is not apostolic, it is not the church. Mm. Can we handle that? Mm. How do we go with that? That's the foundation. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. If it's not built on that, it's not the church. It's absolute. This is, we've got to have this, guys. This is black and white. John 3.16, we all know that one, don't we? For God so loved the world that he gave, he, it issued from himself again, a son to redeem you and I to him. It's all about bringing man back to the Lord. So the purpose of the apostolic is to go forth and issue God's eternal plan of salvation to mankind to redeem man back to himself. And it makes no apology for the truth. When the apostles preached, when the Lord Jesus preached, he preached the truth. It was unsparing and it was total. Meaning it will bring offense. The true gospel is a stumbling block to Jews and an offense to the Greek. So if it's not being a stumbling block or an offence to our hearts, it's not the gospel. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. We've got to see this in black and white or we're missing it. We're playing games. We're going around in circles and it's not going to transform our lives. We're going to be continually, continually in these besetting sins and going around the same old mountain, untransformed. John 5.30, the Lord Jesus himself. This is so beautiful. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. Even the Lord Jesus Christ was sent. He was issued from the Father. So the apostolic church will be made up of those who have seen the Lord. If we have not seen the Lord, we need to fall on our faces and seek him until we do. Amen. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died. This isn't some morsel of introductory flamboyance. This is, a, this is not an idea of giving us a, a chronological flow. There's something important in the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah represents a man who was 
loved of God, who sought the Lord. God used him powerfully fighting against Philistines. When he sought God, the kingdom of Israel was blessed. Uzziah was blessed. But he erred in the end because his heart was lifted up. And how did he err? Anybody remember how he erred? He offered up incense. He went into the tabernacle to offer up incense. And God struck him with leprosy. So why would Isaiah, or why would the Lord see it fit to have this recorded in the year that King Isaiah died? I used to think that was just, you know, giving us a bit of a chronological time stamp so I could figure out, okay, well, that's the year that Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. But I think there's something deeper in it. I think there's something bigger in it. That man had to come to the end. Man had to die. A good man had to die. A man who served the Lord, a man who loved the Lord. He was one of the good kings. But he erred in the end. And the Holy Spirit saw fit to fit this in. I believe Isaiah loved Uzziah. I believe it probably struck a chord in his heart. And to see Uzziah die probably shook Isaiah. It doesn't say that in the text. But sometimes we need to read the text, don't we? And go, well, why would that be in there? One of the great things, I mean, this is a school of ministry, right? This is a Bible school. We need to ask the question, why a lot? Amen. Why is Uzziah in here? Why, why am I reading this? What's the point? Yeah. And there's answers in here. There's truth in here. There's life in this. If we would read it, there's reading and reading. Remember, we can read this quickly and, and get past that and go, well, let's get to the main bit. You know, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Awesome. We just sung that song. Powerful song. Yeah. But let's not miss what's in the text and asking ourselves the question when we read scripture so we need to read scripture prophetically you guys are ministers of god right you're called there's calls of god on your lives to minister to the lord and minister to men so to do that we need to read the scriptures prophetically as well to speak prophetically you need to read prophetically we need to absorb everything that the Lord is speaking in the text and not be so quick and rush to our favorite verses and, and hang off those. There's so much more. There's meat. There's, there's life. If we were to spend time... This is how I read. I'm just giving you... use. That's so Australian, isn't it? I'm just giving you as an example. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> awesome. Okay, moving on. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Whoa. Right there. <laughs> I saw the Lord. When I see the Lord, I fall on my face. There's probably three times in my life I've seen the Lord and every single time I've fallen on my face. Why? Because no piece of flesh will glory in His presence. I can't stand. I've literally, physically had to drop on the floor almost unconsciously. I, it's almost like I lose control of my faculties. His presence is so powerful, so overwhelming, so overcoming that my only reaction is face down. I saw the Lord sitting he sat enthroned during the flood. Sitting speaks of authority. I saw the Lord sitting. I saw him sitting on a throne, speaking of authority. Not just authority, ultimate authority, total authority over all of creation, over the whole universe. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Not multiple lords 
the Lord. Amen. High and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. To be covered with his face. Interesting thing about wings. That the seraphim covered their face. They couldn't behold the Lord themselves. Yet they were without sin. They still can't see the Lord. No man shall see God and live. They saw it necessary to cover their eyes as well with their two wings. Numbers 21, 14. Sorry, Numbers 21, 4 to 9. And John 12, 41. We'll just touch on that. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. It's only hit me today, and I've read this for 21 years. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and it's just hit me this last 24 hours, high and lifted up. This is the Lord Jesus he saw. Now, I've kind of known it's been the Lord Jesus a long time, but the language, high and lifted up, that's no mistake. What was lifted up in Numbers 21? The bronze serpent, wasn't it? He saw the Lord high and lifted up. He saw the Lord Jesus, I believe, crucified. I believe he saw more than what we believe is written in here. Let's read the text. Why do I say that? John 12.41. John 12.41 says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him, speaking of Christ. Christ pre-incarnate. Before Christ came in his human body, he was there, I believe, high and lifted up. The scriptures also state that he was um, a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So if he was slain before the foundation of the world, it wouldn't be a problem for Isaiah to see him high and lifted up. Amen, exalted as well, high and lifted up. Absolutely exalted. But I believe there's a, this lifting up has got to be questioned as well. Why would they say lifting up? He saw the seraphim, the burning ones. It's the only place in scripture where the, the word seraphim is used, meaning plural. The word seraph is used a number of times elsewhere. But seraphim is only used in this passage, meaning plural, more than one seraph, or more than one seraph, a burning one, an angelic being. This is Spurgeon. I found this quote of Spurgeon. He saw seraphim burning ones, for the seraph remembers that even though sinless, he is yet a creature and therefore he conceals himself of token of his nothingness and unworthiness in the presence of the thrice holy one. Don't you have the language? Thrice holy one. Why would they say holy, holy, holy? Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. But not just that, holy attributes of God. So who God is. There's, that's why they continue singing holy, speaking holy. Isaiah heard the worship of the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We read on. The post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. So here's Isaiah and he hears one crying out to another, crying, holy, holy, holy. And the post of the door was shaken by the voice. Now, if the seraphim cry something out and the seraph's voice shakes the doorposts, then how much more will God's voice shake? 
Psalm 29. You can write that down in your notes. Psalm 29 speaks of the voice of God. <coughs> and the house was filled with smoke. And then he says, Woe is me. In other words, that, that woe can mean cursed is me or it can be like a sigh. So that's the range. If you look at that word woe in the Hebrew, it means either a sigh all the way through to the other extreme end of the range of what the meaning of that word means to be cursed. He's just pronounced five woes upon sinful Israel in the previous chapter. Woe to those who call evil good or good evil. We won't go and read it, but after just pronouncing five woes upon men, he sees the Lord and pronounces a woe upon himself. When we see the Lord, we too will pronounce a woe upon ourselves. I know when I saw the Lord in 2001, high and lifted up, I thought I was going to die. I seriously thought I was a dead man. And yet I was living a life of purity, holiness and fasting. I confessed every known fault and sin to the Lord daily in the moment when it happened. And yet I thought I was going to die because of the holiness of who God is. I'm not saying I had an Isaiah 6 encounter. I'm saying that I saw the Lord. I saw his holiness and I saw my true condition. My humanity was as filthy rags. My self, my self-righteousness, my self-worth, my self-esteem, my self-abilities, my knowledge of the Bible, all that I had to count as loss and done. Woe is me for I am undone. That word undone can mean, woe is me, I'm now dumb. <laughs> I've got nothing to say. I'm beyond words. I have... <laughs> Amen? Yeah. I'll tell you what, when I was on that prayer room floor in Nepal, on that first deep encounter with the Lord, I had nothing to say other than tears. All that came out of my spirit was sobbing and weeping over <coughs> my grotesque humanity it was grotesque I could see my own condition before the Lord and his holiness and this is rejected by the church I've shared this kind of stuff with Christians and they've rejected it going oh brother you've probably got father issues brother you probably you know need to see the goodness of the Lord you probably need to understand God's favor and his mercy toward you and I'm going, no, you're a clown. You have never met the Lord. <laughs> you haven't seen him. You need to see the Lord, who he is. My God, he's holy, he's pure, he's, he's perfect. He's, he dwells in unapproachable light. <laughs> Woe is me, I'm undone. And he says, because I'm a man, we'll stop there. Because I'm a man. I used to read that on and go, because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I go, oh, it's all about you know, sinful speech or whatever or telling lies. I've had to stop myself today go, no, no, stop. Because I'm a man. That's enough, church. It's enough that you're a man before the living God. Until you come to that place recognizing that you are a speck of dust, that you are nothing, no, no good thing dwells within us. Amen? I've got some verses to back that up. I'm kind of jumping through the notes a bit faster because I'm conscious of time, but Romans seven eighteen. We have to see that no good thing dwells within man. Romans 7, 18. 
Who can, this is beautiful. Job, Job 14, 4. This is brand new. I just saw it in the Bible today. Brand new. I'm sure God has just put this verse in for this meeting. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Job 14, 4. No good thing dwells in us. Only Christ, which is perfect, which is holy, which is beautiful, which is love, which is life. Only Christ that comes forth is ever going to be received from mankind. Anything outside of Christ is utterly rejected and is flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit and flesh gives, fle gives way to flesh. And Genesis 6, 5, I've got the notes. You can have a look at that as well. Um, so right at the beginning of the Bible, we see, you know, there's nothing good in man. Um, and God, these are God's words. Read Genesis 6, 5. I won't read it now, but you can have a look later. And then Paul says, 1 Timothy. This is, this is at the end of Paul's life, okay? So this is important. I want us to grab this. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Stop there. <laughs> when somebody tells you, like the Apostle Paul, this is a trustworthy saying, worthy of full acceptance, we better stop and go, right, what's he saying? Turn off every distraction around the house, shut all the windows, turn the lights on bright, get the highlighter out, what's he about to say? And he goes, Christ Jesus, sorry, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, amen, of whom I am the worst. <laughs> that's okay, that's good, that sits well with me. Because I've seen my condition before the Lord, it's disgusting, it's a disgraceful mess. <laughs> I am the chief of sinners. And Paul has seen the Lord, Damascus Road, Acts 9. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. He saw the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So much so that he lost his sight. He was blinded. Until what is apostolic, sees itself as the chief of sinners. Until you see yourself as the chief of sinners, you have no place in what is apostolic. You have no place in what is prophetic. The church is disqualified from the apostolic mantle. You need to be able to understand that no good thing dwells within you. The only thing is Christ. Amen. Only he is good. Yes. Call nobody on earth good. So, let's read on. Woe to me for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. It's interesting that God doesn't stop Isaiah right there and go, no, Isaiah, um, you need to stop speaking negativity over your life. That's a negative statement. You can't speak negativity or negative things because whatever you speak out of your mouth, you confess, right? That's the old name it and claim it. If I speak something negative, now I, I have that thing on my life. God doesn't stop Isaiah and go, no, no, you're a nice person and you've got a call of God on your life. You've got you've got you know, ambitions and you've got dreams and you can fulfill all those things. We need to notice what God is not saying in this passage. Not what just he is saying, but what has not been said. God doesn't stop him. He says, Woe or cursed is me for I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Until you come to that recognition of your condition, there's no 
um, place for repentance. The seraphim came and brought a coal from the altar to bring a cleansing to those unclean lips. Now, Isaiah is not a wicked person, okay? He was a priest of God. He was called to this position. And yet he's still identified not only with his own condition, of his own humanity, woe is me, I'm a man, that's your first problem, or woe is me, I'm a woman, bigger problem for me. Um, that was a joke, sorry. <laughs> um, it says, woe is, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. So lips are speaking of what is casual and what is light, speaking things of what is, are not sent, speaking a thing that is incorrect, that's unclean, speaking something that's a lie, that's blatantly unclean, speaking a half-truth, not speaking the whole counsel of God, speaking encouragement when I should be bringing correction, speaking correction when I should be bringing encouragement. That is unclean lips. Withholding something from a brother or a sister when I should be saying something, that is unclean lips. Anything that issues forth or doesn't issue forth from our lips is unclean. So we think it's swearing and we think it's cursing God out or we think it's telling lies. You're only looking with natural eyes. You need to look with what is issued forth. Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, it's what comes out. It's all about the heart. Isaiah could see that his own lips were unclean and by... Um, subsequent revelation, he saw he was from a people of the same condition. So not only does he confess his own human condition, repenting of being a man, <laughs> repenting of having unclean lips, he repents of being in a people of the same. I've been in a church where I said we've need, we need to confess our sin as a church for allowing this kind of behavior going on in the church. There was adultery in the leadership. And none of the leadership wanted a part of it. They said, well, it's not my sin. I'm not repenting. And you shouldn't be telling us to repent. That's not our sin to repent of. I said, it happened on your watch. It happened on my watch. I've repented of this man's sin because I didn't pull him up hard enough. I didn't throttle him to the ground and shake him and say, you're an adulterer, you need to repent, you need to step down from ministry. Mm. I did confront him, but I didn't confront him enough. See, when you're called to an apostolic calling, when you're called to a prophetic calling, you're called to the ultimate thing. Mm. Not just giving nice words on a Facebook site that, promotes nice Christianese or nice Christian encouragement words. To be a prophet, to be an apostle, is to change the landscape of the land. Yeah. It's to pronounce the blessings of God that would physically change a nation. Yeah. It's to pronounce judgments over a nation that will physically change a nation. We're looking at this thing all wrong. We need to look at the big picture. Isaiah pronounced a judgment on Israel, his own nation, and they're under that curse to this very day. Having eyes to see, they do not see. Having ears to hear, they do not hear. This is the call of God to a generation. Why would we live beneath that? Why would we live beneath the glory of God? What are we protecting? We're protecting our own hearts, aren't we? We don't want the fullness. We don't want the confrontation. It's not in my personality to be confrontational. Well, do you think Isaiah chose that? 
Do you think the sons of Levi chose to be confrontational when Moses had strap a sword to your side and go backward and forth and slay your neighbor, your brother, your sister? We don't get to choose, guys. We're supposed to be dead in Christ. Amen? I no longer live, but it's now Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. By His faith, not my faith. Again, it's never about me. It's about Him in me. I want to talk about apostolic sending and I can't even get there. I'm still talking about repentance. <laughs> How's our time going? And he touched my mouth with the coal and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. We're going to need the fire of God's holy altar upon our own mouth. The fire of true, deep repentance. I'm talking about guttural weeping before the Lord. If you have not encountered weeping before the Lord over your condition as a believer, I question your salvation. You might be saved here, but you're not fully saved here yet. There has to come a place of deep mourning over your sinful condition. So the biggest arguments I have with believers or people who name the name of the Lord in this life are people who have not seen the Lord high and lifted up. I never have a problem with those who have come to deep repentance over sin, who are broken. You know, there's a, there's a timber in their voice. There's something about them that's got a, a limp. There's some, you speak about the things of the Lord and they'll start to well up with tears. There's, there's something very real and very, um, very tender about someone who's encountered the Lord Jesus. This is why I'm so against teaching that says you don't need to seek God. God's not lost. Crap like that. When the word of God says, seek God and live. Amen. Seek him and you'll be found by him. Amen. Seek the Lord diligently while, you, while he may be found. There's a window where he may not be found. People see that as works. They see it as Old Testament. We need to seek the Lord until we're found by him. When someone read that verse to me in Jeremiah 29, 13, I, I took it to heart. It was, to me, it was like, this is, this is the way in. No one's ever said this before. This has become illuminated. This is now real. I've, until I seek the Lord, until I've fasted and prayed and, and spent real time alone in the prayer closet with the Lord, until he comes. I'm not talking about just spending time alone in the prayer, prayer closet. I'm talking about staying there until he comes. And I'm, it might be months. It could be months and months and months. It could be days. I remember one time of seeking the Lord for 30 days, all I would do was meditate on Scripture. I think I had a couple of verses the Lord gave me, and I'd go into my room, lock myself away, and just spend time meditating on these verses. And I'd do it day in, day out. And I was going... I don't feel a goosebump. I don't feel anything. I don't sense anything. What's going on? On the 30th day, an angel of the Lord came into the room and read the call of God out over my life. 
was an incredible, beautiful encounter that lasted probably 10 seconds. Changed my life. But it's diligently seeking the Lord. Do we diligently seek Him? Or do we just have this facile, glib, casual, modern day Christianity that that prays at prayer time, prays at meal time, prays at the occasional prayer meeting that suits my lifestyle? Um, do we pray on Sunday mornings? Do we pray on Sunday nights? Do we pray when we need things? Or do we go in and seek the Lord until we're found by Him? That's a requirement. That's not an option. I'm sorry, but when was that ever an option? (laughs) When was seek the Lord and live given to you as an option? I know this might sound heavy, but this is life-giving. There's life in this, guys. This is real. This is stuff. When you see the Lord high and lifted up, when you see your true condition before His holy presence, it'll change everything. Fear of man will go. The call of God will become clear on your life. The pattern the ways of God. Reading the word becomes alive. Yeah. It's a reality. It's, it's not something we do once or twice a week. It's not a lifestyle thing. It is the thing. Yeah. Christ is the thing. There's nothing else. There's no life outside of Christ. It's He gave His only Son. We need to give our life in return. And so it's, an, it's a calling to the ultimate thing, to the ultimate end. So you give in part, you'll receive in part. Amen? First John 2, 6, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. You can't walk as he walked until you've seen the Lord high and lifted up. Until you've come to this Isaiah 6. encounter with him there's no sending unless there's a purification he's not going to send a vessel that's impure Isaiah's lips were purified. They were sanctified. There has to be a sanctification work over what is apostolic, what is prophetic, what is truly sent of him. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Just quickly in closing, and I'll touch on this more next week, Isaiah's response was, Then I said, Here I am, send me. Isaiah had no question. There was no calculation of any consequence that was to come. It was, Here I am, send me. When you've seen the Lord high and lifted up, it's like, I I don't need to say any more. I've seen enough. You have my life. You have my heart. You have everything. I give up. (laughs) I'm yours, Lord. To the ultimate end. 
So all play acting, all play church, all pretense is gone. Anything that is shallow or does not glorify the Lord as it should will grieve you. It will break your heart. You'll want to have no part with it. That's a, a sense that you'll feel in your spirit. You won't have that unless you've seen the Lord. See, we get so dumbed down to what is normal, normalized now in Christianity that we can just go get tattoos. We can swear, we can drink, we can do whatever we like as a believer because it's this thing called grace that allows me to live my lifestyle and add Jesus in when it suits. But I can't see that when I read Isaiah. I can't see that when I read Jeremiah. I can't see that when I read Ezekiel. I can't see that when I read Paul. I can't see that when I look at Stephen's life. I can't see that when I look at Peter's life. It's Christ and no other. No other lovers. No other self-satisfying, self-seeking is permitted. I have died. My life is now hidden with God in Christ. That doesn't mean that you can't socialize. It doesn't mean that you can't own a jet ski. It doesn't mean that you can't go on holidays with your family. But what it does mean is that you are not your own. When God sends you to say something, you need to speak it as it is. Amen? Not to modify it, not to dumb it down, not to change it in any way. You know, Isaiah's first, first mission when God sent him was this. Here I am, send me. And God says to him, go and tell this people. And he pronounces a curse over Israel, which is still in place today. The Jewish people, the Jewish nation, Israel, are enemies of the gospel to this very day, to this very hour, for your sake. They are deaf and they are blind because Isaiah obeyed the Lord and pronounced a judgment over that nation. What will you do when God tells you to say something and pronounce a judgment? Now the Apostle Paul comes out of Acts 13 or halfway through Acts 13 and one of his missionary encounters um, after travelling to an island discovers a, a Jewish man who was a sorcerer and, Jew and the sorcerer starts mocking and, and Paul rebukes him and curses him with blindness. People go on about missions, they go on about healing ministry and doing this and doing that and one of Paul's early miracles is pronouncing a curse over a sorcerer and making him blind why don't we preach that I'm serious we don't preach the whole counsel of the word we only look at what we want to see we only want to look at healings and miracles things that draw men to ourselves See, there's something innate in man that loves celebrity. Look at all the television shows that we see today. Pronouncing and announcing and heralding celebrity, the modern lifestyle of being famous, there's even a magazine called Famous. Instagram, Facebook, the list goes on. What's this new one that's come out? Short videos? TikTok. TikTok. And what's it doing? It's all about self. It's always promoting self. We're so accustomed to promoting self that it's come up into the church to such a degree now that our conferences, 
our mode of ministry is is a promotion of numbers and we'll do anything in the name of Jesus to promote ourselves. If there's any ounce of self in our lives, we will be disqualified for what is truly apostolic and what is truly sent. This woe is me, I am undone, or woe is me, I'm a man, there's your first failing right there. You're human, all too human. You're Australian, all too Australian. You're Tasmanian, all too Tasmanian. You're Kiwi, all too Kiwi. That's your problem. Too human, too much self, not enough Christ. We need this encounter with the Lord, amen, to see him high and lifted up. Let's seek the Lord until we're found by him, amen. I've been saying the same thing for 21 years. I'm going to keep saying it. It's life-giving. It, it will change your life. You see the Lord high and lifted up, you will never be the same. So we need to come back to Isaiah 6. Let's come back to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 26. Let's come back to these encounters where people met the Lord. Why are these texts in here? To prompt us to to expound, to teach us God's ways and how he wants his people to come to him. God's heart in all of this is Emmanuel, God with us. He wants to be with us. Amen. But he can't come near unrepentant, uncrucified flesh. And this is going to take a lifetime. It took Moses 40 years at the backside of the desert. God came looking for him at a burning bush. God even condescended himself to the fact that Moses might not even look or might not even be drawn near. God allowed Moses to, to have the choice of going near to that burning bush or turning away from it. And I want to say this one thing right now. And I think this is important. What burning bush do we have in this generation today? Is COVID-19 a burning bush? Are we looking at these things? Are we looking at the events that are around us today? Are we looking at these examples of God speaking here on the earth, demonstrating himself? And are we seeing it? Are we, are we asking the question, why? What is going on? Or are we turning aside and going on and tending our sheep or doing our own thing? We need to see what God is performing on the earth today. We need to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen? Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Shall we close in prayer? Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I thank you that whatever has been sent today, Lord, will be sealed up in our hearts. Lord, I pray that the weight, the kabod, the glory of God, Lord, will be real to us. Lord, I pray for real encounters with you. I pray that people would seek you, Lord, beyond my seeking, beyond anything that I have come to prior or will yet come to, Lord, that they would see you higher and more lifted up than I can ever do, Lord. Lord, I pray for a grace to seek Lord, let people go beyond, Lord, what is normative of, of our Christian life. May they take this walk with you seriously, Lord. You are, in the end, the high and lofty one. You are the one, Lord, that is only to be glorified. Lord, without you, we cannot see our condition. We cannot see our present state. Lord, and if we are blind, then what hope has this generation got? 
Lord, let our eyes be open. Let our ears hear what your Spirit is saying, Lord, here in 2020. Lord, I pray that those here tonight, those watching and those yet to see it, Lord, would, would encounter you like Isaiah did. I pray that there be a woe is me cry. <coughs> I pray that there be something that would come from the depths from within individuals, Lord, that would be enough to bring a coal from the altar. Lord, head knowledge won't do it. It's going to take encounter. It's going to take a seeking. Knowing these things intellectually. Knowing these things because I've read them. Knowing these things because I've heard them isn't going to cut it. It's just going to harden my heart. Knowledge puffs up. But Lord, I pray a true seeking, Lord, would fall upon your people, that they would truly, truly, truly seek you until they are found by you, Lord. Lord, it's the only way. It's the only way to truly know you, Lord, is to be truly found by you. Thank you, Lord, tonight, in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.